Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Anti-submarine warfare is a team sport, according to NATO's commander of submarines. We'll hear from Sicily, where those teams are practising in major war games. It gives us a chance to operate ASW assets against very capable submarines and submarine commanding officers, the way we would operate should there be a crisis or conflict. Also on SITREP, we assess the battlefield picture in Ukraine. Ukraine, as President Putin claims Russia now has the initiative. Colin Freeman has visited one of Russia's next major targets. The battle there in Kupiansk is still in its early days. We wait and see, obviously, there's 40,000 Russian troops apparently massing outside. So is Russia turning the tide? Mike and Simon will explain what could come next. And the majority of British people think war is likely within the next decade. So why do so many say they would refuse to fight? They're not willing to go to war on behalf of the rich, the powerful, this government, politicians in general. Sidrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. So uh, we're talking submarines to start this week. We know some are used to carry out nuclear deterrent, but even conventional submarines have an air of mystery about their work, don't they, Mike? Oh, yes. There was a very good book a few years ago by uh, David Humphreys, who was a submariner, just called Under Pressure. And it was about what it felt like to be on those patrols, in this case, on the bombers, you know, the nuclear weapons submarines. But all submarines are different. And, you know, Sa- Sandy Woodward, um, he was the commander in the Falklands, and he wrote afterwards, he was talking about submarine operations, and he said, he talked about submariners because they are a special breed. And he said, submariners are, are, are different. He said, that, he said they smell a bit. Um, they be... <laughs> They don't behave very well. They drink too much. They're a, and he called them, he said, they're a sort of dirty habit in a tin. That's what he said in his memoirs. And, they, and the submariners, they revel in that because they say, look, we are the people who are on constant operations. You know, we don't exercise. We go to sea to do real operations, chasing Russian sub- submarines around, protecting our deterrent. We do lots of work. We don't, we don't actually play war games. We are at war all the time. And that's why we smell a bit and we drink a bit and we don't behave terribly well because we're always at war. Well, NATO is testing its submarine and anti-submarine warfare capability in exercise Dynamic Manta. It involves six submarines hunting and being hunted in the Mediterranean off the coast of Sicily. There are also ships from NATO standing Maritime Group 2 and Maritime Patrol aircraft, including two RAF Poseidon P-8s. A total of nine nations are taking part. And Claire Sadler has been watching some of those war games. Hi, Claire. Uh, What did you get to see and do? Hi, Kate. Yeah, I was uh, on board the Italian offshore patrol vessel Francesco Morosini. That's currently the flagship for NATO Standing Maritime Group 2. And from Catania Port in Sicily, we went out into the Med to make contact with the submarines that were taking part in the exercise. And the first thing that we had to do was really find the Italian submarine. Now, uh, it was at periscope depth when we uh, eventually found it. So we were able to spot its periscope and communication towers that were sticking out of the water. And that's a skill in its Itself and something that some of those young sailors on board hadn't actually done before. So it's all, all of this is part of a learning curve for those taking part. And then throughout the course of the day, there were a couple of emergency surfacing. So the submarine would simulate an emergency on board. And, and when we talk about an emergency, it's something like a fire or damage to the hull that would mean it would need to get to the surface fast. So it's quite something to see. The submarine breaks the, the water barrel first. And it sort of reminded me when I saw it of a whale coming out of the water, not something you get to see very often. There were winch exercises as well, so helicopters getting a person or essential supplies on or off the submarine. It was really windy and it did take the helicopter a few attempts to complete that, but it it did get there in the end, but it had to keep going round and trying again. Um, Alberto uh, Terrabotto, Admiral Alberto Terrabotto, sorry, is the uh, submariner and also the commander of the Italian 4th Naval Division. He was on board the Francesco Morosini um, the ship that I was on. So I was able to ask him about what it was that I was seeing. It's um, something that is really important because uh, it's part of our safety. Uh, when we stay uh, for a long period at sea uh, and sometimes uh, we are far from uh, a shore, uh, to be reached uh, in a very rapid way from an helicopter could be uh, a meaning between uh, life uh, and death. 
And there was also a, a German maritime patrol aircraft, and that was dropping sono boys into the water. And those are devices which are, are dropped into the water, and they relay information back to the aircraft of where enemy vessels are. So all clever stuff. And Claire, in essence, is this a giant undersea game of hide and seek? Well, sort of. That's part of it. Um, but mm. submarines are hard to find, which is why they are such a threat. But it's also about the practicalities of NATO allies working together. And that's a phrase of interoperability that we always hear so much about. So making sure that different nations understand the way each other work. Um, Rear Admiral Thomas Wall, he's the commander of submarines NATO. And he was also on board the Francesco Morosini, which is where I got to have a chat to him. Dynamic Manta is the largest anti-submarine warfare exercise Exercise that we conduct in the Mediterranean. It gives us a chance to operate ASW assets against very capable submarines and submarine commanding officers. It gives us a chance to practice, train, and exercise the way we would operate should there be a crisis or conflict. How does Dynamic Manta this year, how does it differ from, from previous years? So it's not the first time that we've done this, it's the second, but we have special operators from one nation riding a submarine from another nation. They'll deploy those special operators, they'll do some activities, and then they'll retrieve them. And the significance of this is I can take special operators from any nation and put them on any nation's submarine, and it really gives me some significant capability to conduct maritime activity. And where do you consider the biggest threats to be coming from? The biggest threat that NATO sees is Russia, and also that from terrorist groups. Mike, uh, Rear Admiral Wall talks there about using subs to deliver special forces troops. What, what else do we use conventional submarines for? What is it they offer as a capability that surface ships don't? Oh, quite a lot. I mean, in our case, a submarine would normally help protect the carrier. So when one of our aircraft carriers is, is at sea, um, apart from the, you know, the, the two frigates, the two destroyers, the supply ships, there's almost always a submarine with it to keep an eye on what's going on underneath the carrier. We also Remember, we they, we use them to help patrol the entrance to the Firth of Clyde when the bombers, the the nuclear the nuclear weapon submarines, the SSBNs, when they come and go on their three month patrols, the channel into the Clyde, the, the shallow channel, has got to be swept and patrolled and make sure there's nothing hanging around there that shouldn't be. And of course, you know, most of our submarines, um, their real job is to protect the gear, the the Greenland Iceland UK gap, the you know that piece of sea between Greenland and the United Kingdom that Russian submarines, Soviet submarines in the old days, used to come through to the North Atlantic to interfere with convoys, particularly troop convoys coming from the United States. That was the old NATO game. And you know that you know the Tom Clancy, fam the famous book, The Hunt for Red October, which became a famous film. Mm. Well, that, yeah. I mean, that book came out in um, 1984. And the Pentagon tried to classify it because it was so full of accurate information. I mean, he, he didn't have any access to classified information. He, he was a train spotter who just worked it all out from what he read. And it was so accurate. And, you know, there are four big routes in the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap because the, the Atlantic there is relatively shallow before you drop off the continental shelf. And it, uh, bringing a submarine through that gap, uh, it's got to stay as low as possible near the seabed. And, and therefore, it's like flying through a mountain range. And so this cat and mouse game uh, that Claire was talking about is absolutely what the hunter-killer submarines are designed to do. And then there's a new role, which is now developing, which is looking after pipelines and cables on the seabed. And even now, this month, we now know that the Houthis uh, at the Bab el Mandeb Strait, you know, at the, the southern tip of the Red Sea, are now trying to get at the various cables and pipelines that, run, well, because there are a lot of them in that area, they're trying to get at them in order to increase the pressure they're trying to exert on the world economy by interfering with shipping. So it's a new area of warfare is now developing in this last decade, which is mm. the pipelines and cables uh, issue, which we've yeah. talked about before on the programme. Indeed, yeah, it's very demanding times. Um, Claire, you got to go on a Turkish submarine. What was that like? Yeah, I did. It was the TCG Anafatala diesel electric um, submarine. And it was fascinating because I hadn't been on one before. So it was a real privilege to get on board. I knew it was going to be small, but it was smaller than I imagined. Um, that, that submarine is 62 metres long and just over six metres wide. But the reality is that most of that space is filled with something. So there's a corridor that runs down the length of the sub that's just wider than my shoulder. So it's really cosy on there. There are 50 crew members 
has uh, two toilets. And this Mm -hmm. refers back to what Mike was talking about. One shower a week for three minutes. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, life on board is is definitely uh, different. This is the executive officer, Lieutenant Commander Alper Varel. It's global. Uh, It's uh, very hard to live in a submarine with uh, discrete and uh, lowered uh, conditions, minimized living areas. We are working in a harmony and the teamwork because at the beginning you have to be a volunteer to be a submarine guy. And if you like to be a submariner and if you know your job well, so we can use to each other. They have to get used to each other in that kind of space. And as I said, 50 people on board, 35 beds. So you don't get a bed space to yourself either. Claire, good to speak to you. Thank you so much for that. Right, quite a few things to talk about on Ukraine. Let's start with this comment from the French President Emmanuel Macron after hosting a meeting of European nations to talk about how they can improve support to Ukraine. There is no agreement this evening uh, to send uh, officially troops into the ground, uh, but uh, we cannot exclude anything. We will do everything we can to prevent Russia from winning this war. And I say this with determination, but also with a collective humility. Well, there's been quite some fallout from that. Essentially, he's suggesting some countries might at some stage send troops to Ukraine, though on a purely bilateral basis, not as NATO. What do you make of it, Mike? Um, it's a clumsy thing to have said. I understand what he meant, absolutely, which is that, that Putin has been setting the agenda. You know, Putin is driving this crisis and everyone else is reacting to him. So mm. what he's saying is that we shouldn't allow President Putin just to keep making the agenda. He, Putin gets to decide how aggressive he's going to be and he ramps it up and he takes it down and ramps it up again according to what he wants. So why are we dancing to his tune is what Macron is really saying. But of course, the issue of troops in Ukraine is a red line because we've always said that we will not fight directly in Ukraine. And that's a red line that both Russia and NATO understand and and want to respect. But also, you know, off the back of that, Chancellor Schultz in Germany has revealed that special forces, for instance, from Britain and the United States, are already in Ukraine. And by saying that, I mean, most of us have said, I'm sure that must be true. But by saying that, he's let the cat out of the bag in in a really unhelpful way. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why Britain doesn't share that much intelligence with Germany Mm. because they really can't keep a secret. And Downing Street, in response to what Emmanuel Macron said, he said fir- very firmly, it's not something the UK would do. And um, what President Macron suggested in follow up questions, though, is that he wants to keep some strategic ambiguity on this idea. Yeah, that's exactly it. So we we shouldn't allow Putin to dominate the agenda. Putin ought to be thinking a bit more carefully about, well, what are we going to do? What is the West going to do? And will the West just keep reacting to what I do? And I mean, what Macron is is trying to get at is quite right, but I don't think Mm. he chose his words or his ideas very carefully. He he does rather talk from the hip, as it were. And uh, it's not very helpful. And I mean, the other thing to remember is that in, in Russia, they watch every nuance and statement that comes out of Western capitals. They're looking for every sign of weakness, of disunity, of lack of coordination. We, we may say in the West, oh, well, it's just a bit of, it's a bit of a loose speak. The, in Russia, they, they log it, they notice it, and they work on it. And we've got to be aware mm. of that. So uh, let's turn to the battlefields in Ukraine and bring in our Ukraine reporter, Simon Newton. Uh, Simon, after the fall of Avdivka, you've been assessing where we might see Russia trying to break through next. OK, yes, I think it's um, it's important to say, first of all, that Avdivka has fallen, but the battle there obviously is still still raging fiercely because it's it's such an important position and the uh, Russians are still pushing out from there to the west. The Ukrainians are desperately trying to pull back to these defensive positions. I think the, the, the nearest town to Avdivka is about 35 miles or so away. Prokhorovsk, a, a town to about 30, 60, sorry, 1,000 people. So that is one of these five key areas, I think, that, uh, that the Russians are trying to attack up and down this 600-mile long front line. They're sort of stabbing away at different sorts of areas. And if you can imagine that front line and how it looks, you've, in the north, you've got this area around the so-called Satori 
Karina line, which is um, up towards Karina, which, which is a town the Russians actually hold. They've got about 110,000 troops up there in that area, and they're pushing out north towards Kupiansk and south towards, towards Lyman in that particular area. There, they're trying to push the Ukrainians over to the west towards the Oskil River, uh, which would be quite significant if they could do that uh, and you know, push them effectively to, to the to riverbank. Away from Avdivka, you've got Bakhmut, which is obviously someone we're very familiar with there. The, the Russians are pushing again. They're trying to push the Ukrainians towards this place called Chazyv Yar, which is to the west of the city. The importance of this place is that it's it's the high ground in the area. It allows the Russians to uh, shell the city of Kramatorsk, which is about uh, 18 miles or so away. So it's a very important key position. The other two places that, that the Russians are particularly trying to attack are around Marinka, which is about 50 miles or so to the south of Avdivka. The importance of this place is that it's very close to Vuladar, which is a, you know, a town we're quite familiar with from the um, counteroffensive uh, last year. There is very important, this particular place, because it c- controls a, a very key highway that allows the Russians to link Donetsk down to Mariupol. And then finally, you've got Robotny, another place that we're familiar with. This is about 100 miles or so um, to the east of Avdivka. Uh, this, very much like Avdivka, is kind of in a salient. It's in, it's in a bulge. The Russians are on three sides of that area. They've got three divisions or so down there, about 40,000 troops, including VDV paratroopers. So there's a battle going on there as well. So up and down the front line, there's these five key areas that the Russians are trying to attack. Well, the Daily Telegraph's Colin Freeman has spent the last two and a half weeks in Ukraine and visited one of the towns which Russia is trying to take next, Kupiansk. We made two visits of a day each. The first day we just toured around the town. It's a hilltop town, about 30,000 people there or so, um, and it's only about 25 miles from the Russian border on Ukraine's northeast corner. And initially it was taken by the Russians at the start of the war. They occupied it for about six months and then the Ukrainians retook it in the late summer of 2022. But for about the last sort of six to eight months, I would say, the Russians have been mounting a renewed push to retake it. It's not an easy nut to crack in some ways. It sits on a a kind of escarpment overlooking a river that heads towards the Russian border it's a kind of natural fortress so some of the soldiers we spoke to there said look this this is going to be a tough nut to crack because all the defenses are in our favor but um we wait and see obviously there's 40,000 Russian troops apparently massing outside so it's a large force it's about the same size as the force that took Avdivka a couple of weeks ago which is uh, where you were reporting from before, uh, in the days before it fell to the Russians. Uh, was there a sense that that was inevitable in Avdivka? Yes, I mean, again, it, it rather like Bakhmut um, back in May last year, the Russians concentrate a huge force on taking, you know, what are pretty pretty small towns, but they are using a massive sledgehammer to crack a pretty small nut. Um, the Ukrainians don't have the same level of troops or weapons that the Russians do. And so when you get these these fixed battles for a small amount of turf, the Russians do eventually triumph. It's a question of what price the Ukrainians make them pay. And um, in Avdivka, for example, the Ukrainians say that they killed, they reckon they killed about something like 17 to 20,000 Russian troops during the last five months of the battle. And Colin, does Kupiansk seem to you to have the same problems for the Ukrainians that led to the fall of Avdivka, or is it looking more resilient at this point? Um, it's kind of hard to say. We didn't hear quite the same complaints about lack of ammunition and munition shells, artillery shells in Avdivka, in Kupiansk as we did in Avdivka. But then the battle there in Kupiansk is still in its early days. And I think they, they may well experience the same problems as time goes on, yes. As I say, they do have the geography that lies in their favour, but certainly otherwise many of the same factors r- remain the same, the, the fact that they've got a mismatch of weaponry and troops compared to the Russians. And Colin, you first told us about troops rationing artillery shells back in the autumn. Having read your reports, it seems to be really impacting the morale of troops now. 
Yes, we spoke to uh, some artillery units outside Avdivka. They said that out of their 18 howitzers, only two were con- currently operational because of the lack of artillery shells. And that, that was very frustrating for them. I think they felt that their morale was still OK. It was just it was anger at not having the actual tools to do the job. And what about the morale of the civilian population right now? It's just one anecdote, but you did write about meeting a taxi driver who's using an app to help him dodge being drafted into Ukraine's military. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Uh, yeah, I'm not. To, to what extent he's representative of Ukrainian society as a whole is another matter. But um, yeah, th- there are there is a, a section of of men who are eligible for military draft who don't want to do it, and who use various different mobile phone apps to swap tips on how to avoid the draft, uh, legal measures, legal dodges, practical dodges, and also just on the uh, tips on the tip offs on the whereabouts of draft patrols, which which tour the street in many big cities like Odessa, where we met this chap. Um, I mean, if if it gives any indication, roughly, I think it's roughly 25,000 people are thought to have fled the country to avoid the draft. Another 18,000 have been caught in the act. That's 40,000. Ukraine has a population in the country of around 35 to 40 million anyway. So it's not a massive number, I guess you could say. But um, uh, I think the worry is that among the younger people and among those who have not fought yet, Uh, those numbers may be higher because those who were enthusiastic and who wanted to fight in the war are already out there. The problem is they've now been fighting two years and they're getting tired. And I know you say that you you can't say it's representative what this person is doing, um, avoiding the draft, but what kind of reasons did he give you that he wanted to do so? He said he had family, he had one son who himself was 18 um, and he didn't want to be, um, he he didn't want to go to Bakhmut and go into battle and get killed. He was blunt about it, to be honest. He didn't sort of say, I've got a bad leg or I have some other excuse or I'm a pacifist. He really just said he did not want to fight. He also didn't think that the training would be very good. He thought he would be given a couple of goes on a gun and then told, you know that he would be off straight off to the front so that that was i suppose you could sort of call a practical reason but at the end of the day he was pretty clear that he just he didn't want to go and was getting killed and colin this was your eighth visit to ukraine since the full-scale invasion are you able to give any sense when you compare your different visits of whether this could be a moment that the tide really is turning in russia's favor Well, certainly this time we went, it was easier to find troops who were feeling downbeat and saying that it was very tough. Partly, I think, due to the lack of ammunition. Also, you know, we were speaking to people in and around the the Avdivka area, you know, after defeat there, although admittedly a very costly defeat for the Russians. It's not surprising to pick up people who are feeling gloomy. Also, though, you know, they, they've lost 31,000 people now, according to President Zelensky. 31,000 soldiers have died. It is two years into the war. Clearly, there is, enormous amount, there is an enormous amount of battle fatigue. On the other hand, we did also meet a lot of troops who said, yeah, no, my, our morale is, is still going OK. We are tired, but we don't really have a choice in this war. We've got to carry on fighting. So I wouldn't have sensed that I saw it, that there was a sea change. Certainly things were perhaps more downbeat than last time, though, yeah. Colin Freeman, thank you very much. You're welcome. And Mike, you, you talked last week about this being Ukraine's 1942 moment, but it not being clear which way the pendulum will swing. President Putin's just given an address claiming Russia now has the initiative in this war. Is he right? Uh, he's right in the sense they they have the initiative in some local areas because the Russians are pushing on all sides. They're trying to take advantage of the distraction of Gaza, the disunity in the United States, and everything that's going on in the Western Alliance. So he obviously feels that this is his moment to push. But what, and Colin Freeman, I think, was bringing this out, as well as Simon, what, what he's facing, President Putin, is the fact that every time they push, they can be fought to a standstill. They can't make any of these offensives count strategically. So they'll certainly retain a bit of territory, I'm sure, take more back. I think they'll probably succeed in pushing 
marching west from Kupiansk at some point during this year, but they can always be fought to a standstill. And, you know, in terms of the swing of the pendulum, the, the swing that matters most is morale that Colin was talking about there. It's the morale. And, and you know, I mean, a, a, a historical example, in 1918, you know, the German army, famously, that was very controversial, when after the Ludendorff offensive and then the Allies swept them back, the German army reformed and was ready to go again. And that was the, the basis of the myth of the Nazis. They said we were stabbed in the back. You know, the German army could have carried on fighting. And the answer was, yes, it could, but no, it couldn't. I mean, yes, it could organizationally. It was ready to go again, but its morale collapsed. And the reason its morale collapsed was not, not because of anything that happened on the battlefield, but because they could see all these Americans arriving. They knew there was a million men coming and a million behind them and a million behind them. It was the fact that what was going to happen that mm. actually sapped their morale. Um, and that was the point. The German army couldn't carry on fighting in 1918 because they could not see that they could succeed. And mm. that's that's the issue to ask yourselves or that's the question to ask in relation to Ukrainian morale. Can they see that the West really is backing them, that things will get better if they hang on? But if they feel that things won't get better, they'll only get worse, then why hang on? And Simon, there is a danger of reading too much then into Russia's victory in Avdivka. Is there anything in the wider picture that gives us a sense of how the balance of power lies in this war right now? I think, I mean, to Mike's point, I think it is a balancing act at the moment. They seem to, it does feel in terms of just the optics alone, if you like, that Russia is, you know, it is swinging towards Russia's favour in some, you know, they are making these small advances, but obviously they're paying a very high price for that. They're, they're losing thousands and thousands of men. They've retaken about 200 square kilometres, I believe, since January the 1st. But a lot of that territory is just small settlements. So not really very strategic, much strategic value. Um, so I think we're in, we're in, I don't know that Mike would agree, we're in kind of positional warfare here, not really true stalemate with the initiative kind of swinging back and forth. Ukraine does have, as Colin said, this problem with, with manpower and ammunition. You know, it does feel like things are tipping slightly towards Russia's, uh, Russia's way. But, you know, even with the advantage of this huge uh, manpower pool and everything that goes with it, they still can't make this decisive breakthrough. So I think in answer to your question, I think in terms of the balance of power, it is exactly that at the moment. It is balanced. And Ukraine seems to have had a run of success in taking down Russian aircraft. Is there any clear reason for why that's happened? This has been really interesting, actually, because they've shot down or 10 Russian planes have come down in, in 10 days or so. I think seven um, SU-34s, some S -S SU-35s and this quite rare Beriev A-50, this Russian AWACS plane you know, with the mushroom on the top that we've seen in the American version of. There's lots of questions about why this is happening. Some believe it's because the uh, Ukrainians have moved a Patriot back battery further south towards Kherson, and they're using maybe some longer range missiles to hit these jets. And obviously the, the Ukrainians do have Russian air defense systems like the, like the S-300, 400. The Russians are using glide bombs more than they've used previously in this war. So that means their aircraft are having to move slightly closer to the target, particularly around Avdivka. They use that system. So maybe they're coming into range more than they were before. Some thought maybe the Russians are just getting a bit overconfident. They're able to fly over the battlefield and they're getting taken down. But there's also some very interesting stuff on Telegram I was reading about, perhaps that the A-50 in particular, this AWACS plane, was actually taken out in a kind of friendly fire incident. And the fact that it was 120 miles or so away from the Ukrainian lines, but it all remains really a mystery how it's being done. But for Ukraine, it's definitely, definitely a, a very good thing. So, Mike, how much difference does the loss of these Russian aircraft make to the fight? Well, it makes a difference if it pushes Russian aircraft away from the front lines for safety. So as Simon says, I mean, if they're losing, you know, SU-34s and even some SU-35s, then they'll tend to, to to stay back a bit. And particularly the A-50, that's important. However, they lost that second A-50. That is a loss because they've only got about eight operational versions of it. And they've got a big front to cover, you know, if, in not, not just in Ukraine, but elsewhere. And so if they could take down another couple of A-50s, the Russians would be in big trouble as far as their AWACS capability goes. And remember, for every A-50 that they get, they get at least 10 or 11 operators who are scarce people. They're hard to train. So in being able to kill the crews of those aircraft, they're also you know, making inroads into Russia's ability to run the airborne war. So while the Ukrainians, they don't have enough of an air force to, to create air superiority over the front line, 
if they can use all of their assets to, to keep the Russians further away from the front line, then that will obviously help. But that's, they've just got to keep at it. And they hope, of course, that when the F-16s begin to arrive operationally, that will make a difference. I'm not sure it will, but that's what they hope. And Mike, we've spoken many times about combat operations going in cycles. What stage of cycle are we at right now? Yeah, the, the the arm wrestling stage. There's a sort of an arm wrestle that goes on, you know, pros and cons, pros and cons, as Simon was saying. And then there's a breakthrough. And sometimes the breakthrough is military. Sometimes it's because one side decisively cracks far enough along the line to open up a strategic avenue that the opposition can pour through. But very often the, the difference is not what happens on the battlefield. It's something else. It's something behind the battle, something political that causes one side to have to withdraw suddenly or to give up a lot of territory or to change its objectives so we're at the arm wrestling stage and the crack when it comes is just as likely to be political as military and simon what do you see coming next i think more arm wrestling i think is probably the uh, the, the likelihood dispositional warfare is going to continue for some time i think i think the russians do seem to have the initiative you know just in terms of tempo of their operations and, and in the sheer weight of numbers that they have but you, know, you hear from, from Western defence officials who give us these briefings. They say there's no sign of any real overall coherent strategic plan behind what the Russians are doing. It's, it's, these, it's these small offensives up and down the line. So I think we're going to see Ukraine on the defensive for the next 12 months, trying to consolidate what they have and, and find this manpower that they need. And Russia clearly, on a, on a political level anyway, wants to try and make Ukraine look like a, like a hopeless case, particularly to this US audience um, ahead of the election in November. Some, and there are some Republican voices in Congress who are obviously starting to agree with that view. So, I mean, we heard from President Zelensky this week saying that he thinks Russia will launch another offensive this summer. Not, we're not sure whether that will happen, but it is possible. By that time, obviously, President Putin will have been re-elected. He could potentially have another mobilization, gather another couple of hundred thousand men. So, it's really critical that the US aid package and this sort of solidarity amongst European nations keeps going uh, for the sake of Ukraine. Thank you very much for that, Simon. Now, when we were talking to Colin Freeman, he mentioned how some Ukrainians are using an app to avoid conscription. Now, you may remember a few weeks ago, polling from YouGov, which found a third of under 40s in the UK would refuse to fight even if the UK was facing an invasion. Well, now they've done more analysis of that data to understand why so many would refuse. Matt Smith is head of data journalism at YouGov. We asked 18 to 40 year olds and we asked that age group specifically because that's the kind of um, that was the age group that was conscripted initially during both the, the world wars, whether or not they'd be willing to serve in the armed forces if the UK was under threat of invasion. We found that a third of them said that they would not, uh, not only would they be unwilling, but they would be, they would actively try and avoid conscription. Uh, and so we, we then asked the same group to tell us a little bit, a bit more about why that was. So the most common answer we, we found with about one in five of this group saying so was that uh, they, they're not willing to go to war on behalf of, you know, groups like the rich, the powerful, this government, uh, politicians in general, often saying things like, you know, let them let them fight first. Why don't they send their children? That kind of thing. And then another popular sentiment as well. Same number of people saying so was was simply that they don't think that war solves anything. Um, it's just an endless cycle of violence, that, that kind of thing. Those were the two most common reasons people gave. So this latest data is basically a follow up onto the reason on, on the reasons why. And looking at the data, is it possible to group it into personal reasons and wider societal or ethical reasons? And, and how do they balance out? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you obviously have uh, other people who are, who are talking on a much more personal level. They individually don't want to die. They don't wish to raise their hand against their fellow man. Um, and also that, you know, for instance, they've got dependents. They would be afraid to leave by themselves back home. I suppose one of the things I would say is that the way these questions work is, is they tend to capture the thing that is top of mind for people. So it's not outside the question that, for instance, uh, among those people who are saying that they, they would refuse to serve because of this government that, you know, should Keir Starmer win the next election, they would suddenly be willing to serve. It might be that their unwillingness now migrates to another reason they wouldn't want to fight, you know. Maybe they expect that they, they would be killed or something like that. And obviously that's personally reasonable. And this is a hypothetical question at, at this point. Is your experience, is it possible to say how much people would stick with these positions or change if war actually 
that came about and the call-ups were a reality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one one of the, the biggest difficulties in, in opinion polling is hypothetical questioning. We we know that people are very bad predictors of their own future behaviour, uh, even with stuff like voting intention, for instance. And so when we're talking about something as dramatic as uh, the UK uh, facing invasion, which is obviously very far from the situation we are currently under, um, it's entirely possible that lots of those who um, are currently reluctant to say they would stand and fight would change their minds. And of course, uh, from the other side of things, uh, those who currently say they'd be willing to volunteer straight away may uh, suddenly find that um, that's a scarier prospect than they initially thought. And um, if we look at another set of data YouGov have just released, it's with a general election due sometime in the next 12 months. The def- defence and security seem to be rising up people's voting priorities. Absolutely, yes. So um, we're, we're seeing about one in five people now saying that um, uh, defence is a top free issue facing the country. That's a higher point than it was throughout the entirety of last year. And it's basically the highest it's been since the invasion of Ukraine began. And now this is perhaps not... Uh, particularly surprising given that in in the first few weeks of this year we've seen uh, Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, saying that we're moving from a a post-war world into a pre-war world and likewise uh, General Patrick Sanders talking about needing to raise a citizen army uh, which has uh, seen many people speculating that uh, conscription might end up being introduced and then therefore unsurprisingly you know people are becoming increasingly concerned that we're on the cusp of a new uh, major conflict in fact uh, separate uh, research that we have shows that the majority of people now think it's likely that there'll be a world war within the next five to ten years matt smith from yougov there uh, mike you've said in recent weeks you think the public are placing more importance on defense the data matt gives there seems to suggest you're right uh, could it make any difference with the politicians though uh, it might do between now and an election, whether particularly if an election is in October rather than May in this country. I mean, already, you know, we've got two ex-defence secretaries, Gavin Williamson and, and um, Ben Wallace, as we're trying to pressurise the Chancellor into putting more money into defence in the budget, which I'm well sure he's not going to do. Penny mm-hmm. Morden has said the same. She's an ex-Minister of Defence. You would expect the military chiefs to say that. But there's an undercurrent now in the Conservative Party that just thinks that we cannot carry on with uh, the sort of defence budget that we've got. And we'll go into an election campaign in a very uh, predictable way. I mean, I could write the the manifestos of both Conservatives and Labour now. because she would. (laughs) Well, I mean, the government always says, this is what we've done, this is the money we put into it, and we've got operations that do this, this and this. That's that's their manifesto. And the opposition manifesto is always, we're having a review. As soon as we take Mm. power, we will have a review, because that gets them out of having to answer any awkward questions. Our policy is to have a review. I could write them now but Mm. the fact is in other ways i think the election when it comes may well feature defense much more than it ever has and you know the the only election that really featured defense that i can think of in my lifetime was in uh, june 1983 off the back of the falklands war and it was then because the labor party adopted a unilateral nuclear disarmament stance and they were attacked relentlessly for it and it cost them a lot of votes in that 1983 election but that's the only election that I can think of where defence featured for more than half a day. Now, in the coming election, I think it will feature for more than half a day, and I think it will be an undercurrent to quite a lot of other issues about what we spend and what we spend it on. Mm, It's going to be interesting to to watch this. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back with another sit rep next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfps.com slash sit rep or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye bye. (laughs) 